So, so you said you wanted to do a quick fire round. What's I, I have a um I have a fun idea where we can get through a lot of topics, but it's just going to be overrated, underrated, <clears> or <throat> some version of that. If you like, yes or no. Okay. All right, or here we go. If you like, pass. We could pass, but mm. it's you know it's a number. Oh, let's, be, let's be controversial. Let's be overrated or underrated. All right, here we go. Charles Dickens. Underrated, underrated. It's, I think he's largely forgotten, largely. I think there was a, there was a resurgence of, uh, in the forties and fifties of like great film versions of uh, Great Expectations, um, Oliver Twist, you know, but then it's kind of all, I mean, they're wonderful stories. So generally underrated. Cool. Uriah Heep, the band. Overrated. Oh. Rush. Hmm. That's a tricky one, because in some places they're underrated, and in some places they're overrated. Wow, that is tricky. They're pretty bloody good, so I'm going to say underrated. If, if you know the full catalog, yes. So I, no, I don't know the full catalog. Well, I, mean, I, yeah. I only know the, the what you'd call the hits or the more popular album tracks. Well, you know? they have a lot more esoteric stuff than that. Sort okay, of. Okay, so they're underrated by me, certainly. Yes. German food. <laughs> <laughs> Overrated. William Burroughs. William Burroughs underrated. I think he's one of the most inventive authors that ever put ink to paper. I think, uh, and, and it, it's, it's, it's unfilmable, you know, which we touched on with The Naked Lunch. How about yeah. Hunter S. Thompson? Hunter S. Thompson, maybe overrated. Keith Jarrett. Ooh. Hmm. Keith Jarrett. Hmm. Probably underrated. Probably. Yeah. Some some of these are difficult because they're, I they're, know. they're from areas where you, you think I want to be fair, but I want to be true. I want to be real, but I don't want to piss anyone off, but I want to, and then you're looking, you're sort of di diving into your experience of these topics. Probably underrated, yeah. General. Okay. Claude Debussy. Hmm, you see, I love Claude Debussy. <sighs> yeah, underrated, underrated, I think. He's not held in high enough regard. And even when, even when people with different kind of genres and textures get to grips with his music, like Tamita, you know, the, the Snowflakes Are Dancing album. I have it on CD. I know, me too, me too, yeah. I asked my wife for it to find it for Christmas. It was one of those things. Yeah, it's just tacky as fuck, but I love it. Yeah, well, WC is important for so many reasons, including the visual connection, I think. Yeah. Okay. Just very pictorial stuff. Very, right? And, and pointedly so. Yeah. And successfully so. Okay. Phil Collins. As singer or as drummer? I'll take both. As singer, overrated. As drummer, underrated. I think he is underrated as a drummer. Yeah, I think he's brilliant. You know, Stanley he's... Kubrick. Ah, <sighs> oh, shit. Hey, these are tricky because I'm placed in the crosshairs here. Some things he's underrated about and other things he's overrated about. Some of his scenes are just too damn long and dull and, and confusing. And then other scenes are so impactful and so powerful. 
I, I, I mean, his uh, Paths, Paths of Glory, I think that's its title. I'm crap on titles. I really struggle with titles. Uh, uh, you're right. Paths of Glory, a lot of that is, is, is bang on for me. But then big chunks of 2001, I'm sat there going, what the fuck am I supposed to do with this? You know, the bit with the chimps, the eight people, that was great. And now, and now he's arguing with a computer. Then what the fuck happens after that? It's totally lost me. Although in a viewing of that film in a cinema, I had to sit in the front row with my friends and I'd forgotten my glasses. And I thought, shit, I'm not going to see any of this film. And watched it and the scene at the end with all the visuals coming at you. When we walked out of the cinema to get the bus home, my eyesight was completely cured. I had perfect eyesight, 2020. I could read the title plates on the buses in the little window above the driver. I could read them coming many hundreds of yards up the road. I thought, my eyesight is cured. I'm cured. What's this miracle? And then within half an hour, it was back to fucked up. Did you ever ask a medical person about that? None of them could answer it. I've yeah. mentioned it to a few people, but none of them could answer it. I'm only guessing that the, the pressure of the light and the images, which because we were in the front row seemed like, you know, IMAX or something, the pressure of the light and the, the constant coming at you, I must have squished muscularly, muscularly, I've invented a new word, my eyeballs back into being perfect spheres. So when I left the, the cinema, my eyes were still circular. And then as the half an hour wore on, they became lax again. And thus my eyesight went back to being pretty, pretty fucked. Well, there I are mean, moving parts involved. There are, yeah, because your eyes will only work great if they're, if they're orbs. If they're any other shape, if they're rugby ball or American football shaped, they're not going to work well. So where are we landing on Kubrick? The Shining? Dr. Strangelove? So much of The Shining is good and so much is bullshit. Dr. Strangelove. Again, so much is so good and the big dollops of bullshit in it. Peter Sellers and Lolita? <sighs> not one of my favorite of his. Peter Sellers is good, but it becomes the Peter Sellers show. It usually does. It usually does, yeah. It, it, there's, you're in danger of that in, in, um, in um, uh, uh, there. Strange Love, you know. Uh, and being there too. Yes, a more subtle Peter Sellers show, but yeah, that's the danger when you, you hire somebody with such a musky odor as that it permeates the whole cinema all over everything yeah, it's all over everything it's a, like it's skunk works you know well he leaves also he has no, these so hang on I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna be a bit naughty and say overrated but he's he's pretty amazing if you say overrated i'm gonna say controversy no, you, hey, wait, you, you, I didn't hear controversy in the, was allowed. You said maybe pass, but I won't pass on any of these. And you said, let's be controversial. So I'm saying you're being controversial. Okay. So I think, I think at the end of the day for me, the, the seesaws just tipping towards bullshit with Stanley Cooper. All right. We can leave it as best unsolved. Yeah. Okay. A few more. Um, Zudhorn Rolo. Oh, underrated. Under underrated, incredibly. And Antenna Jimmy Siemens. You know, I liked his uh, when he went on to play with Moo, with uh, Meryl Fankhauser. I mean, that sounds like a kind of a, a dub of of Trout Mass Replica or something with half the channels missing. You were cracking me up, Andy Partridge. When was the last time you heard that album? It's when it came out. <laughs> oh, it's it's great. It's it's got that it's got the beef hearty and fingerprint. Um yeah the 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 whole of that Moo album have uh, the beef heart fingerprint running right through it. 
it, you know, it's, it's going to be, it's gonna be with, with, with Jim on there, isn't it? Well, of course, but that's why I was so surprised when I did the Zoothorn Rollo record. None of it was really referencing Beefheart. And that was a really interesting thing because I played oh, shit. What I had, how many solo records did he make? The one. In, in that case, I've got it. I've got it. What, how does he get that tone on the first track? It's it's almost as if it's going through some like a ring modulator or something. Yeah, but set on a set on a certain harmonic interval or something. Mm -hmm. a harmonizer. So, harmonizer. Is that what it is? Probably a harmonizer. Yeah, this sounds like a harmonizer. Yeah, uh -huh. there's, there's that. Uh, his writing on that record is quite beautiful. His slide playing on that record is quite beautiful. But anybody that paid for the ticket to Beefheartland, that's not what it was going to be. And I love that about Bill. He's he's incredibly strong in that way. Like he really could write 14 tunes. Yeah. You know, you know, just put that out and all of them are different. Actually, Beefheart, Beefheart has disappointed me. Is uh, those those couple of Virgin albums, the first two. The last uh, two. Not um not to, not ice cream for crow you like ice cream for crow yeah i think it's pretty good i think so too uh but originally guaranteed i didn't like in the slightest but doc at the radar station doc at the radar station is pretty damn good yeah yeah those uh, are the final two unconditionally guaranteed and moon jean, moon moonbeams and blue jeans didn't like those i felt that was um a poor parody of beef fun well, I mean, at that time, Zoot's out, and it's all sorts of guitar nonsense going on. But it's the tragic band, isn't it? That tragic band, yeah, yeah. But you know, I've heard all the stories from Zoot, and and uh, you know, as disturbing as they are. In fact, he's been on this this podcast talking about that. The way that Beefheart worked with them is is super interesting. But when Bill started decided to do it, he basically sent wrote out all the you know programmed all the MIDI parts, and I learned what he was doing from that. And then he, and I overdubbed vibes and drums on that stuff. And then he didn't do anything else for a while. For I, I don't think he's done like an EP since then. Mm. Mm. I've been trying to convince him to, to do another record. He's, he's so great, he's still playing. Well, please, please put a word in for me as well. I will. Yeah, yeah. I, I uh, about a year ago, I, or maybe two years ago now, I made a, I made a missing track from Trek Mass Replica. Oh, fun. I, I, I was the band. I bassed two guitars. I programmed the drums. And for the vocal, I cut up words from all of the a cappella pieces on Trek Mass Replica. Right. And I made a poem over the top. So it's Beefheart talking over the top. Yeah, because there's well. There's Orange Claw Hammer. There's, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of word. Yeah. yeah, there's lots of them. So I, I, I chopped up words that I thought went together uh, and I made up this thing called Bug Dream uh, and it's the missing track from Trout Mask. I tried to get the guitar tones the same. And I'd love so to hear it. I'm sure Bill would love to hear it. We should, we should uh, connect the two of you. I think I failed on getting the engineering correct though because those drums sound pretty poorly engineered. Um, well, you did a great job on Elaguru. Oh, that was that was <laughs> having no dr access to no drummer at that time. I programmed all that on a, a Korg Triple D drum machine. Wow! And um, and I had to learn both parts with the stereo pan control. And I I never realised they did it with uh, with tunings either. So I I did it with you know I I, I had to do it with you know, stretching my hands to, you know, forming all those those shapes. <laughs> Jesus, that was tough. I did it. I did it a, a bar or two at a time. Oh, really? Yeah. And did you play the bass part also? Yeah. Wow, that's it's great. Not it's not bad. The weak point is the is the Korg drums, which are like something like you know eight bit, if that. Yeah, but the idea that. Oh, by the way, uh, John French sent me transcriptions of some of these drum parts that he did. So those are pretty cool too. I don't know how useful a transcription would be to you, but the fact that 
they remains the same part every time those pieces were played. They were not yeah. drum parts that were, you know, jamming. Yeah, they were more like orchestral pieces. They were parts. And, I, and again, I, like, I love that you continued that idea because it, it made such an important statement to drummers that, you know, you're part of the whole composition. What did you think to John's book, the, In the, the Eyes of Magic? Uh, did you read Bill's book, Lunar Notes? Uh, yes, I don't have it at the moment. I read it and gave it to somebody. And the Barry Miles? Remind me of the title. Um, it's called Captain Beef. Oh, sorry, Mike Barnes. This one? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. But the, I, I, I'm reading the, um, it's not in this room now. Uh, it, it's uh, Through the Eyes of Magic. It was wonderful to read, but I felt really angry at Don at the end of it. And I have to say, it, it dented my love of the art. I know you should never mix up the art with the artist or artists in, in, in that case, but it really it began to, to, it began to, to damage the art for me. And I never felt the same about Don Van Fleet or Don Vliet um, after reading that book. As a neutral party, I have to say that I have now heard many different sides of it all. Memory, of course, of 50 years plus is, is an issue. Um, clearly there were some unhealthy things going on. Uh, I have played for long periods of time with Cecil Taylor, so nothing phases me. Do tell. No, just to say that you want to work with a pretty unhinged genius, you do so, and you, you know, in for a penny, you're in for a pound. Mm -hmm. now, Rough with the smooth. Pardon? Rough with the smooth. I, I, I think that that's it. And so, like, luckily, I had played sports. I had been humiliated. I had found a way of dealing with people, you know, having that kind of situation. Uh, and to learn to be able to focus on the music in spite of all the other zaniness, I can relate to. So my position on it is a little bit different in, in that, you know, I have to forgive Cecil for things that, that happened. Uh, Bill seems to forgive Don for things that, that happened. Uh, and the work is great. I do understand the, the, you know, the thing of it being tarnished don't work with your heroes sort of thing. I've, I've seen all, you know, experienced it. But I do think it's like you take with the good with the bad and, and, and I'm no, you know, great piece of work anyway. So we're all sort of dealing with it. That's why when I interviewed Sue, I asked him, what specific means did he use to communicate musical ideas to you? And he was a virtuoso whistler. So the fact that specific lines in that music come out of him whistling the pitches to the guys and they find them, that's a process. That's not him taking credit for that, but there's a lot of arranging going on. And that's yeah. first French and then it's Parkle Road. Yep, yep. And yep. that doesn't happen without these conduits being in place. I've also seen that with other composers. So, you know, it's like, it's like uh, Hal Galper says, it's levels of control. Yeah. And do you like the final product? So the other thing is John had a rougher time, I think, than Bill did. Because <laughs> he stayed on longer. He stayed on longer and he, he was at the sharp end. He got to, he was the one that had to trawl through those tapes, miles and miles of tapes to find two bars or one bar of something. Yeah, and in effect, he's producing arranging at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I always tell Bill, you know, you deserve a credit at least for arranging. There's, there's nothing wrong with putting a, an arranging credit. Mm. Do, you know an era, do you know a beef heart era that, that has an extra weirdly special resonance for me? And I, I don't know why, uh, possibly be, because one of the early incarnations of XTC was called star park and we used to do 21st century 25th century quaker huh. so that whole mirror man album has a special resonance for me 
that kind of that that those long blues tribal jams that they used to get up to i i actually kind of liked that because they they were mysterious and voodoo-esque and they just kind of made a scent that wafted up under your nose like some strange strange blues jostic you know it was smoke it was it was it was smoke made into into music it was lovely stuff i i like that angle of him where he's sort of um he's got the hoodoo showdown going on you know it's yeah, like, yeah he's an obeyer man yeah uh and that he's you know he's coming out of howling wolf but he's also out of his mind and he's into all these avant-garde art things and you know it's such an amazing collision of all these different moments you know yeah. there's uh yeah. free jazz yeah you know yeah. there's there's construction there's chamber in a way of of a chamber mind going on to play the pieces yeah. and, and as as when they touch on corny psychedelia of the week the strictly personal album with all the echo reverb and phasing love that as well that that suited that record and don thought so because before they went out on tour he said yeah i'm loving what you're doing with it and then he heard some people when he was on tour saying oh they've got all that flanging and hippie shit on it no oh yeah i hate that you know but he apparently he loved that when it was being done so and i love it too because it's kind of it's that beautiful wrongness, like the Rolling Stones doing Psychedelia. My favorite psychedelic album is Satanic Majesty's Request. My, my favorite beef heart misreading Psychedelia is, um, is strictly personal. And he also, uh, his word- that, that, that album made John Lennon go from loving beef heart to being very anti beef heart. Oh, I didn't know about that. What happened? Yeah, you know that famous photograph of, of Lennon reading at home and he's got the Safe as Milk stickers on, on the cupboard behind him. Yeah. Um, he loved that. Uh, he loved Beef Heart. And then when he heard that album, he got into his mind that um, Beetle Bones and Smoking Stones was ridiculing the Beatles. So it all went sour after that. Isn't it, though? <laughs> No, well, I don't know. It's kind of it's just name dropping, really. Okay, okay, but Beetle Bones <laughs> and Smoking Stones, yeah. Well, it's a it's a little light boasting, you know. It sounds like a little jealousy to me, but Andy Parker, what is what is this? I've I've been meaning to ask you while I have you here. Pulsing, pulsing. There's a beat in his arm still. Pulsing, pulsing, like the throb of an ant hill. Yeah. Pulsing. It's all about life and being alive. It's all about this this life through an ant hill is is a going through the tunnels like the veins of an ant hill is is the ants. They're like the blood moving through the they're the life in the ant hill. And your your blood is like the the traffic in your veins, carrying all the the good stuff and the bad stuff around your body, because your body is a city. So, pulsing pulsing is is the the similes of life, the the motorway and the ant hill and the blood supply, and it's all the same thing. No death in the rain. I've been washing my hands in the stuff I wash my brains. Yeah, blood. Why is and, he washing his hands in blood? Oh, because it's flowing through his hands. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. But washing his hands and it's got it's it's full. They're full of blood. Right on. It's everywhere. It's 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 life. Of all the obscure tracks to pick, <laughs> that is possibly the most obscure one. Thank you. <laughs> Badge of honor. There's a lump in his throat still at the sight of a crash throw. Ooh, it takes a turn. The sight of a crash thrill. Um, yeah, I, one of Colin Moulding's heavy phobias was being the first on a scene at a car crash. That's no small thing, though. Which he wrote Wake Up about. Oh, that's Wake Up? Yeah, it's about his phobia of, of coming out of his house and there being a... a, a a road crash and he would have to be exposed to it 
Um, but um, yeah, it's uh, th that whole song for me, the pulsing, pulsing one is 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 life and the human body as city, the human body as ant hill, and I visited that simile a couple of times. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's all the same thing: life moving through and and around and on. And, I have some and, fun. You know, responsible for the ant hill fetish? No, Jack Kirby. The man in the ant hill. That really knocked me sideways when I saw that story. Oh, that's uh, Tales of Suspense? Tales to Astonish. Sorry. Tales to Astonish, thank you. Yeah. I, we couldn't let that go. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's who's responsible. I, I so, like that a lot. You see, gone across this ant heap, I had two goes at that, which you may know. I brought, I brought a swampy version up for Todd Rundgren, but doesn't fit inside the circle. So right. that 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 got dropped and uh and then i i the more latin conga percussion based version seemed to find favor with the band uh, for oranges and lemons but the whole fascination with ants thing that was all all down to kirby i'm glad i, I brought it up that's great see you never know when you it's a weird around. circle completed for you now wow you know what happens when you dig around Yep. Okay. Gold. Got a few more for you, Andy Partridge. Uh, Lewis Carroll. Yes. Underrated, overrated. <sighs> hmm. I never personally got the Alice stories until I saw the Jan Svankmeyer film version, which is all bones, skeletons, uh, the rabbit repairing itself where it's a, it's a stuffed rabbit and he's leaking sawdust everywhere and he's sewing himself up so he's not leaking his life force out. To me, that, that was such a different take on Alice. I suddenly got into it and I started reading about the mathematics and logical problems and puzzles hidden in the Alice stories. Um, but also tempered by his unnatural interest in the young girls, Alice in particular. Um, I think he was overly romantically interested in the child Alice, um, but he was a, a bit of a genius to bring out this stuffy Victorian dining and room and drawing room, library, um, drama and dreams. And uh, that's genius. And, and to interweave logic puzzles and math, math problems in with it as well, genius don't like the over fascination with the child of Alice. That's a little creepy, but. But the first part is very subversive, isn't it? Yes. The first part is tripping up stuffy Victorian people's can't deviate mindset. And he had, a, he had a different way of looking at things. How about uh, Tolkien? Well, I'd say, are we on underrated, overrated yes. still? Yes. Okay, I'd say possibly underrated then. Why? Um, because I think a lot of people think of Alice in Wonderland, and certainly Disney only looked at that angle. They didn't look at the, the math side, the logic side, the reflection on Victorian life and Victorian mores. He only looked at the, oh, listen, look, a white rabbit, follow it to a magic land. You know, the, he only looked at that angle, the kind of crass, very childish angle. But there's a very adult, very sophisticated brain thread runs through those stories. So I'd say underrated. Uh, C.S. Lewis. 
I had a mad thing for C.S. Lewis at one time and had to read everything. Uh, in fact, my I see the remains of uh, there's about 10 C.S. Lewis paperbacks on that shelf over there, which I couldn't give away um, because I was really into C.S. Lewis in a, in a big way. I didn't get into the Narnia stuff. It was purely the sci-fi stuff. And I loved it. And so because I loved it so much and nobody ever mentions him outside of the Narnia thing, I'd say for his sci-fi alone, he's underrated. I like that you have your uh, case made before you present. Underrated, overrated, William Shakespeare. Ah, oh man. For me, overrated. But then I hear things that I never knew about because I was not, I couldn't handle Shakespeare at school. I couldn't even handle Lorna Doone and, and, and uh, Prester John and shit like that. So, cause I, you know, cause of my reading thing. Um, so I didn't read Shakespeare, Shakespeare, but occasionally I see some pieces of Shakespeare and they are so beautiful. And do you know what I, the first thing I think of is how the fuck do they translate this into Japanese? But they do. How do you do that? How does it have the same, like birds alighting or like the aroma of something or, you know, how do they, how do they make that? It's like a little insect flies off from your hand when you open it. The, the way the words fall are like, oh, you know, and how does that, how does that come out in another language? He opened his hand. No, he's not saying that. He's saying something that's like a million miles of beautiful. Uh, he's not saying he just opens his hand. It's it's a uh, so that's a tough one because because a, a kind of Shakespeare happened in a parallel universe to me. I for me, he's underrated because I don't know enough. Like one of my favorite films is. Um, Prospero's books, which is Peter Greenaway's adaption or his take on, on um, uh, The Tempest. Uh, lovely film, wonderful film. The, oh, the, whole, the whole film is just like a great dream, yeah. you know? But I love his films anyway. I, I, Z and Two Noughts is good. Um, the uh, Drowning by Numbers is, is excellent. Um, oh, Draftsman's Contract. Oh, so good. So good. Um, so Shakespeare for me is probably underrated. And for certain traditions of English theatre, overrated and overkilled and overpushed. Oh, if that's a, a decent enough answer. Yeah. Uh, Star Wars. Um, should have stayed at three, actually should have stayed at one and a half. Some parts of, some parts of Empire Strikes Back were better than Star Wars itself, but ultimately it's one idea. But that's the, that's the Hollywood thing, isn't it? One idea does well. Suddenly we've got to ring it out to six, nine, twelve and, and don't know, it sort of seems to kill the purity of the, the incident, the incident, the one film. And it's, it's perfectly contained and it's, it's lovely in the thing. So now let's, let's make a load of cheap copies of it. Let's, you know, let's, I don't know, overrated. Patrick Stewart as Captain Jean-Luc Picard in Star Trek The Next Generation it's very he's for me he's the he's he's perfect perfect yeah he's better than than uh what's his name what's better than that what's better yeah. than patrick stewart yeah 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 come on uh who was who was who's the lucy in the sky with diamonds what's his name oh yeah yeah shatner Shat no yeah i mean shatner's fun but yeah, right. it's, it's no there's no gravity with shatner it's just you know, he's ready to burst into a smirk any second. 
where Patrick Stewart brings a gravity to the situation, a gravitas to it, which, uh, but if we're talking space um, serials, it's never been bettered. The English puppet series, Space Patrol, I thought you were going to say Thunderbirds. I don't know space. No, 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 no. Long before Thunderbirds. Black and white? Black and white. Uh, um, it's called Space Patrol. It's puppets. No music. No theme music. No incidental music. All music concrete. <laughs> so it's the music scared the shit out of me as a kid. Because it's all... <laughs> oh, I got to see this. And the storylines are outrageous. They're really outrageous. It's um, it's a, a, a humming top shaped craft, which sounds like a child's humming top when it's in motion. It makes this kind of ring modulated sequence. And that's the sound of the thing in flight. So it looks and sounds like a child spinning top. <laughs> And there's three crew members. There's a Martian called Husky, who sounds like a Bulgarian with a sore throat. He talking like this. And he loves to eat sausages. There's a Venusian male called Slim, who speaks like this with a female voice. And he's got long blonde hair, very, very small faces. Uh, mid-60s small faces, Steve Marriott with its back combed and piled up. And then the, the captain of the Gallosphere is Larry Dart. And he's uh, he's got a, a real kind of no-nonsense American, let's go get them kind of voice. Um, and then they have, oh, man, it's just, as a kid, it frightened me and enthralled me in equal measure. Um, it was ludicrous and wonderful. So for me, there's been no, everything else was, was second billing to Space Patrol. And there was um, a, a mid sixties German TV series called Space Patrol as well in German, Raum Patrulia. And I've been recently getting into that because there's some on YouTube with English subtitles that was made in 65 and aired in 66. Um, so, uh, uh, Star Trek for me didn't quite click when it first came over. I think I preferred Lost in Space, but mm. ultimately it was all second fiddle to the English puppet Space Patrol. So, so please expose yourself to that, if only for the soundtrack by F.C. Judd, Fred Judd did the electronic music for it. I, I can't wait. I'm going to look forward to as soon as we hang up. But um, what about, do you know Patrick Stewart's, speaking of Dickens, do you know his Christmas Carol? Ooh. I'm going to say yes, because it has some big bells are going off. You strike me as a guy who would like a Christmas Carol. Yeah, I can't watch the one with... Alastair Sim? No, I can watch that one. What's the one that was done in the, was it done in the seventies? With, oh, I can see the actor. I can't think of his name. Oh, it's so sad. I'm in tears. I just get, I just get emotional even thinking about the story. Yeah, I know. The redemption. Well, if you, if you love it, Patrick Stewart's to me is probably the highest level. Okay. It's beautiful. And when I'm feeling in a, in a need to sob mood, I shall, I shall find no, I just, it. Just thought this as a sidebar, I love Patrick Stewart. And I think that when I saw that, and we watched it this Christmas, and it's, it's incredible. Um, a couple more. How about uh, overrated, underrated Alfred Hitchcock? I'm not a big enough Hitchcock fan. So I would have to say overrated. Polonius Monk. Oh, underrated. Come on, every everyone needs more Monk in their life. David everyone needs more Splang. 
I mean, what what was it the in that the, that great film, Jazz on a Summer's Day, where the comment the the over the the, the commentator is saying, it's safe to say he is unconcerned with criticism of his work, <laughs> which is fantastic understatement. He's oh, unconcerned yeah. with criticism of his work. That's <laughs> perfect. Yeah, that's a great film. When was the last time you saw that? Not since high school, I think. Oh, man, it is so beautiful. Yeah. The, the editing, the color processing, the, the oh, it's just, and, and the Jimmy Jufri trio opening up and all that, the sequence of the yachts reflected in the sea and stuff to the Jimmy Jufri trio. Oh man, so good. Uh, Mummer by XTC. Very underrated and lost. I understand. The multi-track multi tapes are lost apparently. Without hope? Who knows, because we found the, uh, the multi-tracks of, uh, of Skylarking, which Todd denied having. Well, Mary Lou uh, found them, right? We, we found them because apparently he, um, I think he signed up with Capital or something and they took all his tapes or he did some deal where they took all his tapes and uh, somebody found them in, in Capital in, in New York. We were never signed to Capital, but the fact is they took all of Todd's tapes to, to house them and he had them in his possession despite denying having them. So. I don't think he knew that he had them. I think it took some sleuthing by people that were working with him. But do you also have trouble with uh, Big Express Masters? Uh, yeah, I think the majority of those are missing. And um, uh, something like two thirds of English settlement is missing. There's some of it available? Yeah, I think the odd tracks, but you know, I, we just have to, I don't know, I, I, can, I can never say never because um, I don't know what's going to turn up. You know, you do hear horror stories about studios clearing out. Um, what was the, the one where the Stones and Hendrix did a load of stuff in Barnes in, uh, in the outskirts of London? Oh, um, the Stones did virtually all of their recordings there. Shipping and work. They, when, when they, there's horror stories about skips outside of the studio when they sold the place and workmen bringing out piles of multi-track tapes, throwing them in skips. And one of the workmen going through, taking all the tapes off of the reels and throwing the aluminium reels in another skip for scrap metal. And but just leaving unspooled multi-track tape in, in other skips, you know, in other dumpsters. So I'm going to think, I'm going to think of the name of that uh, studio about three o'clock in the morning. Come on, the Stones did all this stuff there and Hendrix did a lot of stuff there. And uh, anyway. What's your favorite song on Mummer? Hmm. They all have different memories and different. I like Ladybird, but I remember saying to Steve Nye, the engineer, I said, Steve, you don't think this middle bit sounds a bit too much like the Beatles, do you? And because I was really funny about not wanting to people people to think we were anything like the Beatles. I, I, we were starting to get little comparisons and I wasn't happy with it. And he said, well, what's, what's wrong with sounding like the fucking Beatles? There's nothing fucking wrong with that. <laughs> I thought, no, there's not really, is there? There's nothing wrong with that at all. And um, <laughs> from that moment onwards, I kind of, I didn't worry about that, but I used to fret about it before that point in time. Um, yeah, I was, I was very happy with, I was very happy with the way that Me and the Wind came out as well, actually. That's mine, that's my favorite. Yeah, the, the, the little piano figure was originally, I don't know if I can still remember it, it was originally a guitar figure, it was like, Uh, 
something like that. Dun, 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 dun. On the piano, it's like cluster, 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 you know. Dun, 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 well, it ended because I thought playing it on guitar sounded like piano. Let's try it on piano. Oh, that's much better, much more, um, uh, much more. Oh God, what's his name? English composer did a lot of film music, early to mid sixties. Everything sounded like everything he did sounded like it was up on the moors. Oh Jesus! Another one. Brains come to a. I'll get it. I'll get it. I'll, I'll, I'll get it at three in the morning. But, but it, it made me think of his work because that's the sort of clustery stuff he did. Also, Rook made me think of his um, his stuff as well. That that clustery stuff in that. Um, but as soon as as soon as we put me in the wind to piano, it was like that's it. That's it. You know why mess around with an imitation of a piano on a guitar? Let's have the real thing. And it's another piece on the record that has that smaller drum idea, and that that you. Well, were... it's we couldn't get any. We couldn't get any bigger, and I could hear other people riding on that now, so I wanted to go the other way. I thought, well, let me take a look at. We don't have Terry anymore because Terry, unfortunately, got given something which no man should ever be given. Um, which was. His, he he got married to an Australian girl. They they had a son, and she didn't like living in England. She found it damp and dreary, and you know, and she wanted to go back to the sun and the surf and of of Australia. And she gave him the ultimatum, which no man should be given. It's um, you know, your gang, or me and your son. What's it going to be? And, I really, really felt for Terry because I knew that's what it was. I mean, he made some noises about, look, yeah, I don't like this new materialist. It's it's not my sort of thing. And I thought, well, you know what? It, it would be your sort of thing because I'm thinking of the sort of patterns that you did. You know, love on a foreign boy's wages is this. It was part Indian. It was part that Indian. That kind of banger rhythms type stuff. It was partly that. And it was it was partly this kind of almost like um, Bodron kind of drumming, you know. And I, th I think Terry would have been great with it, but. He, he disparaged the materials. Oh, I'm not liking how the material's going. I'm, I'm leaving the band. And, you know, he couldn't say I've been given, I, I've been given the ultimatum that no man should be given. Um, and unfortunately, he did get given that ultimatum. But he's back in England now because uh, he's divorced man and he's living with the first love of his life. Oh. He's got back together with the first love of his life. And... Uh, Things are great, and he's trying to take a, a, a he's trying to take XTC out on the road and uh, spell E X T C. Um, How do you think about that? He's T C Terry Chambers. Um, I think I'm okay with it as long as it stays as performing XTC material. I'm not sure how I'd feel about it if they recorded new material under that name um that may be that's something i'd really have to think deeply about but um you know i i i i heard a, a one live thing of xtc the the terry thing before covid bit and i thought they were pretty good um but uh yeah he he uh he, he would have been great on Mummer. I mean, he would have been perfect on, on the closing track, which is really the first track of, of Big Express, which is Funk Pop a Roll. Um, that, that to me is where the Big Express starts. Yeah, that's interesting. The transition to Big Express from Mummer is, uh, is kind of yeah. planted in Mummer. Yeah, the train journey comes out of the countryside and gets into the industrial part of the town. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just like coming into Swindon. You come through the Vale of the White Horse. You look up, there's hills, you know, with the White Horse, the Stone Age, Iron Age uh, White Horse on top and these beautiful countryside with all their Stone Age burial barrows and monuments and stuff like that. 
then you come into the the remains of Victorian industry Swindon and uh, to me that was where the band I, I, that's where I wanted the band to go I was enjoying the brutality of a Lindrum and I was enjoying how Pete Phipps was interfacing with a Lindrum drumming live with a Lindrum and Lindrum doing part of it him doing part of it yeah. or one or the other I was liking this kind of industrial brutality. That's and a John Henry situation also for the train. Sorry, sorry, it's a what? And it's like a John Henry situation with the train, the man versus the train. Yes, exactly. And well, the, the whole train thing was an analogy for, for life in Swindon. It's kind of like the, probably the nearest we've ever done to a concept album was the Big Express, because that's the Big Express is the Great Western and you worked inside when you worked in Swindon. Inside meant inside the ginormous Harkonnen landscape of the factory of... Uh... You're, you're giggling because you know what I mean. Baron Var Var Harkonnen, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but the whole kind of everything's filthy industry and, yeah. and it's everyone went deaf that worked inside because of the noise of hammers and, you know, and their, the average age of a great Western worker is shocking. It, what do you think the average lifespan of a great Western worker was? In that industry there? Yeah. Uh, I would think 52. It was 24. What? what as yeah. a when? Uh, well, when when it started, when it started up in the eighteen forties, uh, for for many years, the average age of of deaths, because there was a lot of accidents. So the accidents, yeah, a lot of people breathing in foul stuff, a lot yeah. of people losing limbs, a lot of people dying for various diseases or or kind of stuff to do with the the processes they're using and doing 24 was the average age like the average lifespan because you'd start in there as a kid you know you could be working in there as a child literally so i, I love that xtc embraced the the regional and the the local and i think that that's super important to to the identity of any good band and and I well, think like I say, got us mocked in England, but for Americans, that that was that was something exotic. Yeah. So obviously, but how many bands that that we like had problems with the UK? You know, like ton, so tons of bands just got nowhere in in home you know waters. So uh, when I met Ringo Starr, he told me that all the bands that he liked were American, and I said all the bands I like were English. Well, that's the exoticism, the different. Yeah. I, I met Ringo once and I had to confess to him that I stole his drumsticks. Oh, did you? Well, at Colin, well, the band were in Air Studios in Oxford Street in London, starting the mixing of, uh, of Mummer. Um, so it's a Mummer pertinent story as well. But um, we were looking to get a low generated bass tone on Wonderland because there's no bass guitar on Wonderland. It's all keyboards, yeah. right? It's keyboard. Bu, 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 bu. And um, he, he, uh, um, Steve and I said, oh, George Martin's in. He'll know how to get a low bass tone. So George Martin came in and George Martin sat at the mixing desk. We're mixing Mummer. George Martin sat there and I'm thinking, this is just, hang on, I'm pinching. You know, this is too weird. This is just too weird. And, uh, and I know McCartney's in the building and Ringo Starr's in the building because they're working on the soundtrack of the appalling film, Give My Regards to Broad Street. I don't know it. Uh, don't bother. Okay. It, it's bad. And anyway, so, so we worked with George Martin for about half an hour or so, which was, like I say, weird dream, you know. But... Um, and I'd see McCartney kind of, I saw him rowing with George Martin in the canteen and they were both stood by the phone on the wall and they're rowing in whispers. No, I don't fucking, I don't fucking, I can't fucking do that. I don't well, don't you think you could fucking maybe blah, blah, blah. And they were having an argument in whispering. 
and it was really surreal. And I'm sat there having my sandwich, you know, and a cup of coffee, and I'm trying to pick as much of this argument as I can. But uh, Paul and, and Ringo uh, and, uh, and Linda and somebody else possibly uh, would be in there until about six o'clock in the evening. Then they would go home, like regular job, you know. And so I said to Colin, I said, um, hey, they've gone home, you know, the Paul and Linda have gone and that. I think they're empty in there. Do you fancy having a look at what they've got in there, what their setup is? Yeah, all right. So Colin and I went down to the studio at the end of the corridor, turned left and in into the recording space. There's nobody in there at this point, you know. Uh, I don't know what we were going to say if somebody walked in. But uh, we went in and there was a, a big bass set up with a huge pile of plectrums, like a, these massive white triangular plastic plectrums about this size, but a big pile of them, you know, about this sort of height, like a pyramid of this. Was he using them? Yeah. And, um, and then there was a drum kit. Uh, so when you walked in the door facing you as McCartney set up, to our left and facing the control room window was Ringo's drum kit, very minimal. And he had a half moon leather custom made cushion, which was cream leather with maroon piping around the edge, maroon leather. And he had Ringo in maroon leather attached to the front of it. So that was his dampening cushion was his special Swish Ringo leather dampening cushion. I like maroon with cream, though. That sounds... Yeah, good. very tasteful. Yeah. Very early radio scheme, you know. And uh, there was a pair of drumsticks laid on the snare drum. And there was, like, splinters everywhere where he'd been banging the shit out of these drumsticks. And uh, I thought to myself... I wonder if he'd miss a pair if I help myself, because I'm not a thief usually, but I am a big beat on that. And I thought, this is a chance for a pair of Ringo's drumsticks. And I picked them up and they were mismatched makes and they were very damaged. I don't know, he'd been doing a lot of ring shots or a lot of something. And so I thought, shit, what do I do? Do I take these? What do He'll know. He'll know. And he had a bag of sticks hanging on his tom-tom, on his floor tom about this many sticks in there. And so I, I saw what mismatched makes they were, put them down, pulled out, found a, a mismatched pair of the same makes, the same two makes. I thought, right, how can I fuck them up in the same way? So I took my keys out and I fucked them up with my keys and left all the flakes everywhere, you know. And I took his pair that were on the snare drum, put them in my back pocket, and I laid the newly fucked up pair on the snare drum. And then we went over, and I took one of McCartney's plectrums. Then we went over to Linda's Fender Rhodes, and there was a, a, a mirror about this size led on the top of this Fender Rhodes with a big pile of coke on it. <laughs> so not being a coke fiend, neither of us touched the coke. So we left that. There was nothing to, for Beatles souvenirs there. <laughs> so we both took a plectrum and I took the sticks. And then um, I met Ringo once during the filming for the Spirit of the Forest charity record for the rainforest. And I thought, I've got to say something because I feel so guilty. So I walked up to him and I said, look, I'm really sorry to confess this, but one of the few things in my life I've ever stolen I'd stolen a bottle of milk from a doorstep one morning because I was so hungry. I stole uh, uh, a jacket that a drunken builder left at a party I was at. And I stole a pair of your drumsticks because I'm a Beatle fan. And bless his heart, he did like the perfect response. He never said anything. He looked down at this incredibly expensive watch he had on and he just looked up at me and he, he went, as if to say, you're not having that. It was great. It was such a Beatles. It was like a scripted moment from Help or Hard Day's Night or something. He just furtively looked up and covered this expensive watch. And he said, that's completely all right. You can help yourself. I'm glad you... And I said, yeah, I've got them in my attic now at home. 
Oh, I'm glad you I'm glad you're enjoying them, you know. So he was completely cool. fine about it, but I had to confess. But Ringo is so cool. He's the coolest Beatle. Yeah, and, and and so funny. I mean, just just that action of covering this, you know, this this watch he had on cost more than my house, you know. Yeah, I, I was very fortunate to meet him because I was working with Todd at the time, uh, filling in for Prairie here and there, and he was in in Ringo's uh, All Star Band. So when he introduced me and he said, uh, "Boss, this is Greg Bendy, and he plays drums for me." Ringo starts launching into this thing about gear. I thought we were going to get dismissed. You know, we take a picture, blah, 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 we're moving out. He said, you know, we used Mylar plastic heads on Revolver, but then by the time we got to, to Sergeant Pepper, we used uh, calf skin. And I just thought, okay, first of all, he's talking gear to me. Second of all, I know there's a difference in the tone of the drums between those two records. <laughs> So, he, you know, he was incredible. I said, you know, my mom used to sing Yellow Submarine to me as a lullaby. And he said, well, then we're brothers. <laughs> Corny sod. <laughs> but, no, he, he's a great drummer. I really like his drumming. But you know who broke, who, who messed up those sticks? Wasn't Ringo. Ah. McCartney <laughs> is a slam. <laughs> You think Paul sat in and, and... It's very possible. I mean, that would be my take, because Ringo's not a slammer, but Paul is. I hadn't thought of that angle. He, Ringo, in fact, the same story. Ringo says to me, you know about the cask and head thing. Keltner was on the All-Star Band, and so I'm playing, and McCartney sits down at Keltner's drums, and he's banging the crap out of them, and he goes right through the snare drum head. And and Keldner says, oh, no, no. And, and, and McCartney says, oh, no, it's fine. I, I'll get you another one. He says, that was the one. It's like James Jamerson's bass strings. Those are the strings. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so that Ringo told me that story in this gear discussion. So wow, incredible, you know. To also, am, I the only, am I the only person in the world that thinks Paul's drumming on Dear, Prud Dear Prudence is a little too stiff? It was a demo. The t -t 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 his hi hat. There's there's no t -t 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 there's no swing. It's all every beat. It sounds like you you did it on a lindrum. Yeah, I'm the only person that used to think that. <clears throat> it hasn't come up because I'm a fan of Paul's drum takes. Oh yeah, generally, I mean, he he does great on. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, he does great on uh, back in the USSR. But always, even as a kid, I thought that drumming on 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 um, Dear Prudence is very stiff. Surely that's is that Ringo, you know? And I later found out the first two cuts are Paul. Yeah, they don't sound like Ringo, do they? No. They don't have the, the swing. It's interesting. Pat Mastellato spoke with Todd uh, Burkhardt about you picking out the, the little feel that you wanted while you were making uh, oranges and lemons and how you knew specifically from a group of six different takes of the same or similar thing that you knew exactly which one was the feel. Oh, that's interesting. And I found that interesting because it seemed to me like you were on a micro level with that kind of thing. And that would explain a lot because you seem to do that on everything. Well, to me, the, the groove is in the cracks and, and you know, you, you've got to get in those cracks and, and that, that conversation the drummer is having with himself. If the conversation with himself is not quite right, it's not going to be quite the same language as the other players are speaking. You know, it's going to be too colloquial or it's going to be, you know, ancient. It's going to be ancient British as opposed to Middle English or whatever language the rest of them are speaking, you know. So, yeah, I, I, I did. Um, but I, I think I think Pat respected that. And, uh, you know, we all had our demands. I had demands that I wanted certain things to be a certain way, have a certain swing to them. 
he had his way that he wanted to, he'd say, try it like this. And I'd say, oh, that is preferable or whatever, you know? So there was, I was open to persuasion, but I'm one of those sort of people, if somebody brings up a better idea than the one I've had, we'll go with that one, you know? And then as a producer, Paul Fox, um, who unfortunately is really suffering from early Alzheimer's. Oh. He's really laid low by it. Um, he, he obviously had an agenda where Geffen were pressing him for hits. You know, we got to have hits. So uh, he had his, his agenda. But between, between the three of us and, and what the band wanted to do as well, Colin with his songs and the sort of feel Dave wanted. And, you know, it, it, worked, out, it worked out really well. Pat was a great choice. And he, he came recommended by Paul Fox, who also said, you realize you, you know, I, I've asked uh, Tony Williams whether he wants to come down and play on Chalk Hills and Children. And I just chickened out. I thought, no, he's, I can't have the man who's drumming on my Desert Island album. I can't have me telling him, no, can you make it a bit more like this or this? I couldn't, I couldn't do that. You know, I could do that with Terry Chambers or I could do that with Chuck Sabo or Prairie Prince or Pat Mastalotto, whoever. Uh, uh, Dave Mattox, uh, um, Paul, uh, Pete Phipps. I, I, I could do that with those other people because it, it was the situation, you know, that they were for hire. But with Tony Williams, too, it was too different. It was too, too voodoo for me. And you wouldn't, he wouldn't have taken direction. So you're, you're no. actually sussed it out correctly. Because but part, of me thinks, part of me thinks, what would that have sounded like with him doing his low level thunderstorm over it because he did it he did he did different degrees of thunderstorm you know you could have storm you could have rumor of a storm storm approaching full-on storm none more stormy storm receding rumor of the storm having passed you know he could do all those flavors but it what you got was a storm yeah Oh, it would have been interesting, but, you know, uh, Vinny Kaliuta could have been interesting, too. <laughs> well, I'll tell you another name. Who was the drummer in Prince and the Power Generation? First, or you mean the female drummer? No, the big, uh, beefy black fella. What was his name? I really don't know. Damn, I feel ashamed that I can't remember his name. Uh, um... He's not the fellow that went on to drum with McCartney's live band. Oh, uh, Abe Laboreal? Yes, I think his name was in the ring. He's and I, didn't, I didn't, didn't know who he was at, the point, at that point in time. That would have been great. That would have been really interesting. But Paul Fox said, look, you know, I know Pat. He's, he's a great drummer. And I thought, okay, if the producer is recommending somebody, you know, but it could have been Abe Laboreal Jr. Uh, Chalk Hills and Miniature Sun are such great pieces on that record. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, I love, by the way, having the instrumentals that you've been doing, making the instrumental. Uh, oh, you can hear what's going on. I, I happen to love those as, as, a, uh, as a geeker. But to, to be able to hear. Well, you, don't think Miniature Sun, you don't think Miniature Sun is too loungy? But you know, you subvert that because you've got all that guitar sliding stuff. You got the trumpet that's get going mutant. Yeah, it's a, it's a MIDI trumpet. Oh, it's perfect. It's a MIDI There's trumpet. No Isham on that at all? Yeah, Mark Isham is playing that. But then Mark Isham plays play. Mark Isham plays all the trumpet on that whole album. Yes, but it's MIDI trumpet. It's a real trumpet with a MIDI attachment that converts to MIDI. So we mic'd up the trumpet and we took the MIDI signal and mixed them together. I didn't so know you've got, you've got MIDI trumpet and real trumpet simultaneously being, you know, not only the ba ba da ba ba da 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 ba ba da 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 Oh, that's so hip, Andy. I did not know that. I know that yeah. there's a transformative aspect to that period where 
you know, you're able to double and triple things. I always wondered, was there a double going on with the base in uh, Scarecrow People? Oh, not that I can remember. It may have been, it may have had some sort of delay or chorus on it. Uh, I know, I know that Colin, uh, Colin played a, a fantastic bass um, called an Epiphone Newport, and it had a broken damper on it, which if you pulled this damper on, it, it wouldn't quite function properly. And it sounded like when you when you DI'd it, it sounded like an upright bass. So the upright bass you're hearing on things like um, Lady Bird, Me in the Wind, yeah, all that sort of all this this thing you think is an upright, it, it's not. It's this uh, this this broken damper of an Epiphone Newport. I was convinced it was an upright. Well, he does play he does play on English Settlement album. He's playing fretless. It's he owned a fretless uh, Dan Electro in the early days of the Helium Kids. But I, I had to paint frets on it for him because it was just too out there. Um, you know, I have and, to say, uh, Colin having fretless bass in XDC was always a plus for me because it was a different character of a rock band, just in the way like Mick Karn in, in Japan was. Oh, doing yeah, that. he was excellent, Mick Karn. That, that was the reason we, the Tin Drum record was the reason we worked with Steve Nye because it was like, that engineering of, of that album is so beautiful. Let's have some of that beautiful. And can I ask you something? Do you remember the song from that album, Ghosts, being a hit? I don't think it was a hit, was it? It was. It was a UK top five. No. I swear to God. Jesus Christ. I'll send you the... Never registered that. Never registered. I remember them being on TV doing it and thinking, okay, nice piece of art there. But you know, it's no that payola, darling. Uh, maybe, but that was a big hit for them. I know that, and it's such a strange idea for a single, too, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I like I like Japan. I I didn't like the heavy metal type Japan. I I like the uh, the Tin Drum album for me. Just had it all. That was the the peak of their what they were going for, and and I just loved the sound of Mick Karn's bass, um, and. Uh, and Steve what, uh, Jensen, the drummer. Yeah, I just just like the sound of his kit, actually. Yeah, right. I don't, I don't know how much was Steve and how much was Steve Nye, the engineer. But um, well, Steve Steve Jensen is a really interesting percussionist in general. His solo stuff is great too. You know, and so I always noticed that they had a similar approach to let's have drum parts. You know, let's let's mix different uh, drum sounds his setup would seem to change too, like some short, he had a lot of short, choky kind of China things and splat right, yeah, things. Yeah, you know? yeah. And I thought that yeah, was- I, I, I liked it when Terry experimented. He, he got into this thing called Sniper, which were pads you put on your kit, which trigger. went, do you know the Sniper? They're like triggers, right? Yeah, like the trigger pads. And then you had these um, basically tone wave generators that you could shape a tone, you could either have it static or you could have it bending down at whatever rate or ascending up at any rate. And uh, so he had one on his snare and I think he had one on the bass drum. He may have had one on a tom as well, but it sounded fantastic on the snare drum because you had the conventional crack of the snare and you also had this, oh, oh, this kind of gulping with it. Um, and on the bass drum, he'd have like, you know, an octave below the bass drum, which was frightening live because, you know, we do run away and uh, you'd have this bass drum and then a, a kind of an octave below with the sniper with that. Is that coming from dub? Yes, I think so. I mean, we we liked reggae. We liked, we loved reggae. We loved disco, especially yeah. the kind of pea soup disco. That's in a lot of XDC songs. You'll hear, you know, we love in our sound checks. We ne inevitably gravitate to playing chic numbers, or or 
you know, uh, stuff from sort of quasi disco stuff. Like, um, I think in, in Saint Checks at one time, we'd ran through everything on the, um, on the low album, David mm -hmm. Bowie, and we ran through everything on uh, 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 the Iggy Pop, uh, The Idiot, was it? You know, nightclub in and stuff like that. It's sort of quasi disco kind of stuff. So, so we were big into into dance music. It's just that our music wasn't particularly, it didn't particularly come from a dance place. In fact, if anything, we like to, in the early XTC, we like to fuck up dancers by by stopping the stopping the track and you know and seeing how annoyed we could but it was confrontational we like being confrontational it was the dada thing you know yeah. we, we we liked it if if fights broke out really yeah well i rem i remember i i thought i was going crazy thinking are we the only sort of proponents of kind of dada music in england and we got to switzerland the first tour of switzerland and this fella came into the dressing room and meekly gave me a badge that he'd made at home. And it said, Dada liebt vol in XTC. Dada lives on in XTC. And Somebody got it? Yeah, this little Swiss fella. And I, I was so chuffed with getting this homemade badge. I've still got it somewhere. It's in one of the drawers over there, I think. But, but you know, you heard, me, you heard me mention it earlier, Andy. I, I, yeah. You guys were subversive. And I think that... Uh, you know, that was the fun of it. And that is the fun of it. You know, you know that Orson Welles getting pissed off about the bad copy he's reading for the car. Oh, yeah. Hey, you don't mean in July, do you? Do you? Is he doing peas or something? Yeah, it's like, you, you can't start a sentence and emphasize in. That's like him yeah. saying, you know, so, and that's that thing. Fellas, you're losing your heads. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. great. I've got, I found that on a tape a few days ago. I forgot I had, um, there you go. Well, I it's, quote it all the time. Uh, I, I found it. There you go. It was, um, we, we had a, a cassette we all copied called Rude and Silly, the Rude <laughs> and Silly tape. And here is, I, I re-found Son of Rude and Silly tapes. And yep. um, the, there you go. Uh, the original one had like the trogs on it and stuff like that. Is, I'll, I'll, I'll sprink, sprinkle some fairy dust on the bugger. Yeah, this one's got History of Rings on it. Have you ever heard that one? No. History of Rings, you'll find that on YouTube. It's an Australian doing an awfully well-spoken advertisement for a jeweler's. And he's a history of rings. Uh, but every time he says rings and then he has to go into, you know, the, the jeweler will hand make your ring and all this kind of thing. And he will, uh, the, 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 you'd have to hear it. I'm not going to do it justice at all. But he he breaks up every time he says the word ring, because it's colloquial for your asshole, right? Okay. So this this fellow goes from awfully well spoken to to oh mate, I can't fucking say that on air. I'm fucked here. It's, it's yeah, history of rings. So find that one out. Um, there's Harold Wilson, the British Prime Minister, getting upset at leaking tapes. Uh, a drunken sports commentator, David Coleman, on live TV. Um, blah, 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 blah. Um, Richard Burton. Oh, I've forgotten what that is. I'll have to give that. A, a, Orson Welles. There you go. And one on here called uh, Balls, which was one of those music and movement tapes for young children in the 1950s. Come on, children. What I want you to do is imagine you've got balls. I want you to start playing with your balls. Have you got your balls in your hand? Are you throwing them? Toss them, toss your balls, toss them up high. Now grab your balls, show them to your friend. And it's it's all done in this very prim, proper school mom's voice. You know, I hope you're enjoying playing with your balls. <laughs> so that, that predates the Alec Baldwin take on uh, the food of a, a dessert or called a ball, like a cheese ball or a Christmas kind of dessert. And oh, he, I don't know that one. And his name is Bob Schweddy, I think, Steve, Steve Schweddy. And would you like to come taste my sweaty balls? <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> you couldn't make it up. <laughs> but, but I think that the other one had beat him to the punch. Yeah, I'll tell you that uh, also, we've, it's all been downhill since the Trog tapes. 
The Trog tapes are incredible. Yeah, and because you know why? That is us in the studio. No. Yeah, yeah because when we all get together, our yokel accents come out really... Here, Terry, play us that, do us that drum roll you were doing in rehearsal earlier. You fucking, you fucked it up bit now. What the fuck are you doing? You know, and... and, and we are doing it fucking wrong. Yeah, dubba 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 cha. Dubba dubba cha. Yeah, is it cha? Well, where's the, is the cha? Is that the snare drum or the hi hat? What is, the uh, top skin floor? Yeah, yeah, top top. Hey, hey, I can't fucking play to that. I knows it's wrong, and I'm the cunt who's playing it. It's the trogs in the studio was us in the studio. This is why it had extra potency when we heard the trogs tapes. We were not only rolling on the floor laughing; oh. it was. It was laughter of embarrassment that we knew that was us. Really? Yeah, there are little clips that have resurfaced. There was a thing called something like the Ballad of the Wanking Man, which <laughs> I, I think got hidden somewhere on a secret track on, maybe it was on Coat of Many Cupboards. How cool. Hidden somewhere on there. And it, it's, it's us, you know, dicking around. We're trying to get a tape of something, a take of something. And Chamber, Cherry Chambers is, is shouting things like, you know, you don't fucking get this next tape. I'm going to come in there and I'm going to wank you dry. <laughs> Your sand comes out of the hole, you know, and, and just just the sort of stupid shit you'd say, you know, not thinking the tape's running. Right. So, yeah, we were the trogs. Damn it. Well, I, I'm glad that I'm speaking with a member of the post-trogs union here. Yeah. Yeah. Annoyed me when, annoyed me when REM were kind of flirting with the trogs and I thought... No, you haven't got the yokel. You haven't got the yokel standing to be messing with the trogs. Were there any other contemporaneous bands with you guys besides Japan that you were really interested in? I also found it interesting that uh, Virgin, at the same time as, as you guys, has Beefheart and he has Japan and he has Mike Oldfield and he has Halffield in the North and Egg. It's a really Speaking email wise to Dave Stewart this morning. Oh boy, he's one of my yeah. all time. Yeah. Yeah, we have a little email correspondence thing. But uh, there were some bands. I mean, we were we were interested in the Talking Heads because we toured Europe with them. They they liked what we did and they liked us as people. And also we had a really powerful PA system, so they got to use that. So it was like a, we traveled in the same bus with them. I became pretty close friends with David Byrne and we had a um, sort of writing correspondence for a few years. And if I was in New York, I'd get together with him and have lunch or whatever, you know. I started the terrible rumors about him being a scatologist. And of course he isn't. It was just a, a, a gag I started with an interviewer in England who I knew was gonna be talking to him next. And I said, yeah, whatever you do, don't talk to him about his fetish for scatology, you know, as a gag. And of course he brought it up, this interviewer brought it up and, and this yeah. ran for a while. And, and so David was kind of, you know, I think mock upset with me. I think it was mock upset, but I did, I did honestly name their second album, the, the more songs about building some food. We were playing in a gym in Holland somewhere uh, something like Groningen or Nijmegen or somewhere like that. And um, we'd, uh, they'd finished their set and they were toweling down. We'd got changed because we'd finished ours, obviously. Um, and uh, David Burns said to me in earshot of everyone, oh, Andy, we just finished the, the next album. What would you call it? What would your idea of the title be? And I said, well, on the evidence of the first one, I'd just call it more songs about buildings and food. And they all rolled on the floor laughing, thinking, OK, I've made a gag and they got it because they knew kind of in their heart. That's what the, all the songs on the first album were about, buildings or food. And they were all, oh, ha, ha, that's right. They fucked me. They went and called their, their second album more songs about buildings and food. And... I, I, I promise you it was me. I really promise you. So we kept our eyes on what the Talking Heads were doing. And we always got compared in the British press as being like poor relations. Oh, XTC are just, they're the Talking Heads from Swindon. 
and it was we didn't think we were that similar to each other musically we could see very different lineages and very different paths you know um i'm trying to think if there was anyone else most other bands we saw as competition that we gave no regard to if if people came out with new ideas you looked at them and you were either okay we can't learn anything from that or we can learn something from that uh but I think most of our learning had been done. What we had to learn was how to write more material, get better material, and how to translate this between ourselves, you know? Um, well, certainly uh, you guys had your own standards and I think that that's really important and that's, that's really what we're talking about. They had your you know, we, we, we took as much We took as much or more from the past than we took from contemporary things. You know, we, I'd get into rediscovering our old rock and roll recordings and suddenly became obsessed with Slapback Echo or uh, uh, Terry would, would get into sort of, you know, uh, um, the early days of rapping and, and disco drumming or Colin would, would get more into McCartney's lyricism and his playing. And I think he wanted to be more like uh, that kind of melodic kind of lines, bass wise. Uh, he was getting out of the riff years and getting into having the bass singing, singing a contra line, you know? Not just playing dan, da da dan, da da dan, da da dan. It was more boom, ba boom, ba ba boom, ba 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 boom, ba ba boom. You know, it was singing a contra song. He got more and more into that, which was fantastic. Uh, Dave just became a better and better arranger, more and more tasteful, more and more tuned to what, you know, I could leave Dave with a string arrangement, say, Dave, can you arrange this for a string quartet? And, and it'd be perfect, yeah. you know? And so I, I, I think we, we grew together. We grew from being New York Dolls, Stooges copyists, to finding our own voice and then really refining that voice to digging deep inside and everyone helping translate those things that came from inside. I think we did good. You did, you sure did. It stands on its two feet, it does. When Andy Partridge writes a, a song, it stays written. And it's got to have a damn good middle section. Yeah. It's, it's no, no lazy rhymes. Man, do I hate lazy rhymes. How do you feel about the cover versions you've heard of your music? They're okay. It's kind of, no matter how proficient or how clumsy, it, it rises above all that because it's really warming that somebody wanted to cover it. That outweighs all of proficiency or lack of proficiency. You know, whether they're covers on melodicas by a couple of Japanese people or whether they're a, a, a fierce improv band playing, you know. No, I was really, I was really touched when Fish uh, uh, would break into Melt the Guns in their live set. And I thought, wow, you know, this is a, the band that's got this reputation of being the modern Grateful Dead. Yeah, and, uh, they're all good players. Why are they messing with our material? You know, um, and uh, for for all of myself and Todd Rundgren's bad blood, which it's all been said a thousand times over, I was really touched when he did a version of "Dear God." You know, what a great arranger that man is. Um, it really is. Yeah, excellent arranger. You know, arranging is a big part of, of the music and, and certainly, you know, demos are cool, but then, you know. Well, demos are great. What better learning devices than demos? The second you've recorded it, you know what's right and what's wrong about it. But until you capture it and you can hear it back, preferably in the presence of one other human being, because you think you got something sounding really great. And then you say, 
listen to this and you play it for one other human and you think shit it's too slow shit it's too fast oh my god there's too much of that that's too long that verse is not needed we need another section oh my god you can hear everything suddenly what is it to do with the presence of one other person what is that what what's that psychic trick that the presence of one other person does their body language as they're listening and subtle face cues and even I can't, I can't even look at them when I play stuff no, to people. I, I can't look at them. But I can't look at people. I'm a bit Japanese like that. I have great trouble. I think it's the sort of border autistic stuff. I have great problem looking in people's, people's eyes. I can look in yours now because you're, there's the separation of, but I, 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 I was once told that if you look anyone directly in the eyes, you either want to fight them or fuck them. And, and it's kind of true. So I'm a bit oriental like that. I look away. And Dave Greger is very much like that. He'll look away. He won't stare in your eyes. Um, but then again, the whole band was kind of dysfunctional anyway. So, you know, that's another topic. Andy Partridge, you know, we were going on five hours. I think you better spread this over a few podcasts. I think to, it'll it'll be cut up appropriately for digestion. But uh, what would you like to say to the to the XTC fans at this time? I'm sure that they they're uh, hoping to hear something new or something different or what's happening in in your world. Well, just to sum up what I'm at at the moment, I can't move on until I move this giant mound of quite beautiful shit. Um, I, I've had at least the last 10 years attempting to songwrite for others, be a songwriter for hire, as it were. Isn't it only, is it more than 10 years? It must be. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. So, um, and for every 10 songs I've written for people, maybe one got covered. So I'm stuck with nine, which I think are good enough or else I wouldn't have offered them. But usually they're, They've been, I've been requested to write in a style. Oh, my artist that I manage wants uh, some songs like McCartney. So I write a bunch of McCartney songs. Oh, my, my group or my artist that I want wants some Christmas songs. So I wrote a bunch of Christmas songs. Uh, my group, my artist wants some songs that sound like the 60s, but they have modern kind of powerhouse kind of blah 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 behind them my artist wants some some quiet more folky type so i what i do is is write these songs but um in fancy dress in musical fancy dress uh but i still had a very low hit rate as i say for every 10 i'd write one would get accepted the other nine and i'm thinking shit, there's nothing wrong with those nine songs. That's actually better than the ones you've picked or the one you've picked, you know? So uh, what I'm going to do is clear all of the shelves of the better of these songs. And if I said a hundred songs or more, um, I'm, I'm going to be putting out a series of EPs called My Failed Songwriting Career. And they're going to be all these wonderful rejects. So this is in addition to the stuff that's not used on Fuzzy Warbles? Oh, absolutely. Fuzzy Warbles were, was all of the stuff encompassing the XTC years. Wow. I have, I have albums of library music that never got released. Some of it got used on Peter Blegvad and myself, Gonwards. There's him doing poetry over some pieces I had, which were my failed library music career. Were you uh, into uh, Slap Happy back in the day? Yes. You were? But, sorry, what were you into Slap Happy? Yes, the few pieces I heard of them, uh, but much more into Peter as when he was solo Peter Blegver. You know, I produced, produced his first solo album, Naked Shakespeare, um, and uh, was always getting involved in productions from then on. Then he and I worked on, we did the Orpheus album, uh, which we did in my garden shed. And then we did Gonwards, which we did in a friend of mine, Stuart Rowe, his garden shed. Um, but um, no, I, I've lost my track now. What was I talking about? I was talking about 
yeah, I, I've got to get rid of this mountain of um, songs that weren't quite right for what these artists or groups what, asked me for. Um, but unless I get rid of them, I have to I have to get them out of my system or they will haunt me forever and I won't be able to think of new landscapes. So this is what I'm doing at the moment. I'm tarting up really quickly banged down demos, usually recorded in an afternoon, in an hour or two. Sometimes in the presence of the artists I'm supposed to be writing for or with, sometimes without them being there, usually quickly. Uh, when the monkeys asked me for a Christmas song, I came up with six. Um, so they did, they did one of them, which was not the one that was written for them. It was actually written for a female artist who wanted to do a Spectre-esque Christmas song. So Unwrap You at Christmas was, um, was written to be a Spectre-esque Christmas song you know, the same changes, the same sort of mm -hmm. feel. Um, so I've got to get rid of all this stuff. I've got rock and roll records. I was asked by rock and roll artists, you know, who wanted classic sounding rock and roll stuff. So I've got to get rid of all this stuff before I can move on. How many hours of stuff? I can't honestly tell you, but I'm thinking at the moment, I'm going to probably do 16 or so EPs to start with four track EPs. So, yeah. When can we expect that? Hopefully first one in a, in a couple of months. The trouble is all the pressing plants are been smacked with COVID. And so I've been told yesterday that the queuing in the pressing plants is, is like 10 times what it normally is. Yeah. Mike Keneally is doing his new record uh, on vinyl and, uh, as well as CD and he's got a similar issue. And Well, I, I've got volumes one and two ready to go. Uh, I was bouncing down volume one yesterday. Uh, I shall commence bouncing in volume two tomorrow. And they get mastered in the next couple of weeks. Um, but there, you know, people have to bear in mind that it's me writing for a purpose. It's not me it's me in fancy dress. You know, the artist wants to sound like a country song. The artist wants to sound like a McCartney song. The artist wants to sound like an Elvis song and so on, you know? I do, I mean, and it's no small thing to have such a musical range as you do. Well, it's, it's because my career has come out of being an imitator. A bad learner, but I can imitate. I can, I was always good at doing voices and I could have been an impressionist, you know. Uh, my wife tells me you could have had a career in stand-up, but I, I think before stand-up comedy, I think I would have gone into being an impressionist. Yeah, or a voiceover actor seems like. Yeah, something like that, you know. But impressionist, because I was good at, at copying sounds. I wasn't good at copying how you do that music, that, that took a lot of sweat and 10,000 hours at least, but I was good at imitating sounds. And, and I know you wanted to talk about powers and we didn't get around to it, damn it. Do you want to talk about powers? Absolutely. Okay, because I'm going to eat in, I got to eat in the next quarter of an hour, so I'm going to- Let me set, set you up with a premise about powers. Okay. I'm listening to powers and I feel like I'm hearing someone who listened to a lot of early tape and music concrete and poem electronique by Varese seemed to jump into my head at, at one point. I, I, I had a real thing for that at one time. Early 70s, I lost myself in, and I've forgotten so many of their names now, so many of them seem to be French. Um, Pierre Schaefer. Uh, did he do the one about the bird song? Uh, bird song, which one? Oh, uh, something about bird song. I'm terrible on titles. And then there's also, uh, how about the Stockhausen Gesunge die Englinger? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was big on Stockhausen. I, I went through a cage period. Um, coming from Space Patrol and 
uh, Fred Judd's uh, um, sort of music concrete uh, tape experiments for Space Patrol really, you know, I was at a tender age and what is this? I've never heard anything like this. You know, and it led to me wanting a tape recorder and doing my own experiments. Um, that's another interview. Um, but I was I was big into into um, I, uh, Morton Subotnik. Yes. Uh, um, <laughs> I mean, even the kind of corny stuff. Tonto's expanding headband. Yeah. No. Uh, who, who made certainly made uh, uh, Stevie Wonder's latter career for him. Um, but. Uh, I, I, I lost myself in a lot of la electronic stuff and still return to it. But I've, because of the synesthesia and not reading, I used to go to the school library because we were instructed, not the school library, sorry, the, the council estate library, because at school we were instructed, you've got to take out three books this weekend. You know, it was, they encouraged you to read. So I would take out things that either had pictures in them and when I'd worked through all the picture books I used to take out the the, the sci-fi novels that had great cover art and I would just lay them on my bed and stare lay there staring at these covers like they were portholes of a spaceship and you're looking out at these universes and 90% of these covers seem to be done by, I found out much later on, they were done by this artist called Richard M. Powers, American painter. And I would disappear into the worlds that he painted on the covers of these books. I never read the books because that was the phobia of it print. Uh, but I would totally turn, I would go into a trance staring at these covers. And I heard these covers in my head. And I heard glimpses of these covers as I grew in the electronic music and concrete that I was getting exposed to. And I always said to myself, one of these days I'm gonna make the music I heard in my head as a child looking at these book covers. And I'd get out like three a week, lay them on the bed, do the same ritual, they'd become like the portholes and, and I disappear into these covers and I can hear the things I'm seeing. I can hear these the, the shapes are, are resonating in my head. So I thought I've got to make. And, and a few years ago, I, I thought now is the time to do this. I've got to do this. I know it's not gonna sell. So we're gonna make a limited edition because I don't want to embarrass myself. So I think it was something like 500 or a couple of hundred. I can't remember how many now. And um, I made these pieces. I didn't even want them to have titles. I just looked at Richard M. Power's artwork and I tried to get back to that place. And then I found a book in a London bookstore, uh, which is just over there. And I can't reach it because there's a load of records in the way. That is a, a kind of an overview of Richard M. Power's artwork. And this was great. I would prop it up in the studio and I would try and make these sounds and try and take uh, uh, synthesized sounds and normal sounds like orchestral sounds and, and fuck them up so they sounded like these paintings. And then I found who owned his or who looked after his estate. And sadly, she wouldn't let me use one of his paintings for the sleeve oh. because, uh, well, it was under, they were under such strict conditions that I couldn't have abided by. I couldn't afford what she wanted, money-wise. Uh, the, the image cannot be cropped. You cannot crop off his signature. You know, it was too restrictive. Is, it, so is I, he a big name? Is he a known name at this point outside of your tribute? I, I think certain people collect his artwork or his book covers, that kind of thing. But I think it's pretty niche. I but she was, a, she was a hang dog. She said, you know, she sunk her teeth into me. You've got to use it only under these conditions. But I couldn't afford the amount of money because I made it for nothing. And I think she wanted something like three and a half grand, uh, um, which I didn't have the money to make to make that deal. 
So I thought, fuck it, I'm going to paint an ersatz piece of powers and make it look like a paperback book from the 50s or early 60s that Powers would have done the cover to. So the shame of it was that I couldn't use a piece of his artwork, so I, I had to mock a piece up, but I got to finally, I got exorcise this sonic, frightening sonic sounds from my head. And I thoroughly enjoyed it too. And so many people said, oh, I've heard Powers, now I want a copy and this, it's all sold out, what do I do? So we remade it a, a kind of permanent edition CD now. Yeah, I, I missed getting one, but it's, it's incredible. Very three I'll different- send, I'll, I'll send you one if you want. Well, we can trade. I'll send you one with my uh, Kirby. Great. Excellent, we'll just swap. Yeah, I, I found the, the production to be very three dimensional. I love the use of the of the differing the collage nature of it as well as the foreground background the wide stereo of it it's it's really quite quite uh, quite impressive and I highly recommend to people if, if you've not heard powers it's it's some very interesting Andy Partridge stuff I have to say it's definitely headphones on lay down darkened room go on your own voyage with it stuff that's what I'm in for yeah, but that's what I did with those book covers as a kid. So if I can enable other people to do that as well, fantastic. I, I, I think I kind of, although I was very young, I think I kind of astral traveled in a weird way with those covers. The only other time I've consciously been aware of astral traveling was, um, and, and now I have to go and get something to eat, was listening to the Third Ear Band's first album on headphones, led on the bed, and I went to some other universe, I'll tell you, some other place with monolithic architecture flying past me at a, an incredible rate. And ah, oh, wonderful. But we'll do that another time. I've got to wait because I'm not with a skeleton covered in skin. We will, we will, uh, we will do that before your skeleton steps out. And uh, hopefully we will do this again soon. But uh, Andy, thanks for all the music. Thanks for all the ideas. Thanks for the inspiration. Cheers, Greg, my pleasure. And, and we, we do appreciate you and we're looking forward to more stuff from you all the time. It's, it's a topic of conversation that comes up frequently. Yeah, I can't, only death gonna stop me. Well, good. Uh, listen, thank you, Andy. Thank you everyone for listening. This has been uh, such a treat to, tra to, to be able to chat with the great Andy Partridge. And we'll see we'll you do it again, Greg. We'll do it again because I can think of a thousand and one things we've not even touched on. That's for sure. All right, buddy. Oh.